My name is Victor Ramirez. I am the Programs and Events Coordinator for the BHA. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first session of our uh, Word of Talk speaker series. Our guest speaker is Dr. Anthony Knopp. Uh, Dr. Knopp is an Emeritus Professor of History at UTRGV. A native of St. Paul, Minnesota, he completed his Doctor of History at Texas Tech University in 1973. In the course of his career, he has taught courses in government and geography as well as history. His areas of research and instruction include Mexican history, U.S.-Mexico relations, U.S. diplomatic history, border history, and Brazo and Matamoros history. He has co-authored and co-edited 12 books on local and border history in addition to num numerous articles. Dr. Knopp currently serves on the Bronzo Historical Association Board of Directors. Without further ado, Dr. Knopp. Before I... Uh, clicker here. Before I forget, <laughs> I wanted to uh, inform you that these are available on sale. These are, it's not my book, this is Carl Chilton. Carl Chilton did a lot of uh, work in history here locally and he produced this book, some of which I re researched into to, to, uh, for this talk. Uh, they're available uh, at the front, so I just wanted to point that out. We're looking at water and how it, what impact it had on the Rio, lower Rio Grande Valley and Brownsville. And uh, the first, the earliest involvement, obviously, uh, has to do with the uh, approach of the Spanish. Uh, came by ship, obviously, into the Gulf uh, and not only did you have exploration, but of course, in the early years, supplies and trade would, were also involved. Uh, here's an actual ship from that era, the Nuestra Señora de Atocha, which was uh, a shipwrecked off the Florida Keys, and later on, much later, centuries later, they found it and found some of the wealth on that ship. And of course, when the Spanish arrived, there was already somebody here. <laughs> In this area, it was the Coahuiltecan Indians uh, who were hunters and gatherers. They were many different tribes, many languages, not terribly well organized into, into some particular people. Uh, but they had almost no agriculture. And obviously, the question is, why? And the answer is, Rainfall in this region is not enough under normal conditions for agriculture. Uh, as you can see, the annual rainfall in Brownsville is, I've got two different sources, so I put them both up. 25 and a half inches or 28 inches. The catch is you need 18 to 20 inches during the growing season, and we don't get that normally. Uh, so insufficient for agriculture. Now, the Spanish settlement, here you have the man responsible, Jose de, Jose de la Escandón, uh, Conde de Sierra Gorda, uh, and he was the founder of uh, Nuevo Santander in 1746-47, uh, and this included the RGV because settlements were made uh, in the RGV uh, at that time, including uh, Reynosa, for example. And land grants were issued along the Rio Grande. And here you can see how that worked. The porciones, as you see here, pointing out thin strips of land that were granted, and the importance of them being thin strips is because you, you wanted to have access to the river, the water. That's what was really important. And you see down here, we have some much larger grants. I'll point another one of these out a little bit later. But these were the, the most significant grants, the ones that touched the river. Again, the access to water is the crucial factor. 
now the water would, from the Rio Grande would enable you to survive and uh, perhaps grow a little garden patch or, you know, you couldn't grow any commercial agriculture so they raised cattle. And here are the kind of cattle that they raised in this area, the Criollo cattle, which were bred to survive dry conditions. And uh, they didn't export the meat. They couldn't possibly have kept it fresh long enough. What they did export was hides and tallow from the animals. Now here's that uh, land grant I showed you earlier, the big one, Jose Salvador de la Garza, uh, Espiritu Santo grant. Uh, and on this one, this map, which is from 1860, the map itself, you can see that Brownsville, where Brownsville was established, and of course, not surprisingly, on the water. <laughs> so take a look here. here, Rancho Viejo, here's Brownsville, here's Matamoros, of course, because Matamoros was founded a long time before Brownsville. I like to point that out for people who are not acquainted with the history of the Twin Cities that uh, uh, Matamoros, the be very beginnings of Matamoros occurred about the time of the American Revolution. So think how long Matamoros was in existence before you get Brownsville, which is in 1850, 1848, 1850. Notice the other grants. You can see some of the names of them there. Again, they're along the water. Now, Matamoros, <laughs> one of the reasons that it thrived in the late 19th, uh, late 18th, early 19th century was because it established an illegal trade with New Orleans. By illegal, I mean that all trade in uh, new in, in Mexico, what became Mexico, uh, was supposed to be funneled down to Veracruz. And then the trade would go out from Veracruz over to Spain, and trade would come in from Spain to Veracruz and then flow out from there. But uh, here are people in Matamoros and even pirates from other areas established an illegal trade with New Orleans and the problem, what's the problem with New Orleans? Well, it was under French rule and then it was under American rule after the United States uh, uh, made the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Now, I think it's also important to note that the way the trade uh, operated was that the ships would come over and they would go through Brazo Santiago, uh, Santiago Pass behind uh, Brazo Santiago Island. Why? For protection from the elements. And they would offload their cargoes on the smaller ships behind Brazos Island there in the South Bay. And then they would go out again and come down outside the coast out here and go all the way down to the, where the Rio Grande emptied into the Gulf and then they would come up the Rio Grande to Matamoros. That's the way that worked. Why didn't they just offload them here and uh, have them lugged up there? Well, <laughs> it was a lot easier to go by water. That's the answer to that. Here you can see a photographic uh, a opening, the, the, the Brazo Santiago Pass, and of course that's the entrance to the ship channel today. Here is a, a little of, uh, old portrait of uh, uh, Mexican-American War showing General Zachary Taylor, the American commander on horseback at Palo Alto, where the first real battle of the civil of the Mexican-American War began in 1846. And steamboats move supplies and troops on the Rio Grande. General Taylor's supply, supplies arrive through the Gulf from New Orleans out to what's now uh, Port Isabel. And 
there they created a fort. The place where the lighthouse is was originally Fort Polk, named after the president of the United States at that time. So they wanted to have a fort there in order to uh, protect the supplies in case the Mexicans attacked. And they moved, as I say, moved supplies and troops on the Rio Grande. Uh, I don't know if any supplies were ever moved uh, <laughs> to, to, to anything to do with the Mexican-American War on this particular ship, but I wanted to show it to you, this steamboat. This is the Antonia, and it's kind of famous because <laughs> a little bit later on in the 1860s, that's the ship that the Imperialista forces of Maximiliano, who was the uh, emperor of Mexico for a time, arrived on uh, uh, to Matamoros. They came up on this particular uh, steamboat. Um, Austrian troops, some Mexican, some Belgian troops. And that's also the uh, boat that carried them away when the uh, uh, Maximilian's forces were forced to flee. Uh, by the way, uh, that particular portrait is available, <laughs> I've discovered online, you can order copies of it, you know, just like it's on a canvas. So, kind of a neat uh, boat, actually. Now, two riverboat pioneers on the Rio Grande. Uh, Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy, uh, they were uh, active in providing supplies, moving supplies for uh, General Taylor during the war. And of course, as many of you know, <laughs> both men uh, became quite wealthy later on, owning huge tracts of land, the King Ranch and the Kennedy Ranch, which still exists today. And uh, there they are. Uh, when we get into the 1860s, then we're getting up to the Civil War. And again, Brownsville and the Rio Grande uh, played an important role here. And again, water was a big factor in it because Confederate cotton was all that the Confederates had to make money. The Confederacy didn't produce much except cotton. So, they would ship their cotton overseas and buy guns and uniforms, etc. But after the war got started, the Union declared a blockade of the southern states. So, how are they going to, in other words, the Union uh, Navy would try to intercept those ships. And as they became more effective, the Confederates looked for another route to try to get that uh, cotton over to Europe, so they could buy stuff over there and bring it back. And the route they came up with was to uh, bring it down to uh, Brownsville and bring the cotton down here and cross it over to Matamoros, at which point it became Mexican cotton. And then they would move it down the river and to a place, a little community uh, gone now called Baghdad, and they would offload that cotton onto lighters, small vessels that would take it out into the Gulf of Mexico and load it on the ships that would go over to Europe. Well, couldn't the Union forces stop that? Well, physically they could, but it would be against international law to interfere with the Mexican cotton trade. Here you see, uh, I. I I don't know, do you suppose this looks like a photograph to me? Maybe it's a painting. What do you think? I don't know. Anyway, if it's a photograph, they colorized it somehow because there weren't any color photographs back at this era. And here you see a couple ships at the landing, well, actually three uh, uh, steamboats at the landing in Brownsville. And notice, back at this time, this was not a very formal operation. Notice the riverbanks are just dirt. There doesn't seem to be any system really for uh, loading and offloading. Uh, kind of a ramshackle way to conduct business. But then Brownsville 
in these early days, this was a frontier town. It was a, a rough place. After, after the uh, Civil War, uh, King and Kennedy brought in Charles Stillman <coughs> and created a monopoly of 26 riverboats. So they controlled, basically controlled the commerce coming to Brownsville on the river. Uh, however, they ran into a challenge from some other local folks who wanted to uh, uh, create a railroad and eventually they succeeded. A railroad in from Port Isabel or Point Isabel back then uh, all the way into Brownsville and that would lead to the demise of the riverboat business. Slowly, it didn't occur overnight. But here you can see the last steamboat on the Rio Grande. This is uh, the Bessie, operated until 1903 by William Kelly. The riverboat monopoly sold out to Captain Kelly, but gradually, you know, his riverboats got sold off and so on as the commerce on the river began to decline. By the way, it might be interesting to know that the, the uh, uh, riverboats went regularly up as far as Rio Grande City and they even went as far as Laredo one time. I think there was an expedition basically that uh, took a riverboat all the way up to Laredo. Just that you couldn't count on having the same amount of water being available all the time. Uh, Captain Kelly had been in the Civil War and he became the basically the first founder of the library here in Brownsville. His, at his location, his, I don't know if it was just his home, that's where they had the books. And he was also the chairman of the uh, public school board, creating the first real public school, the grammar school at Washington Park. And now the Putinat uh, school is there, but they have a big photo on the front of the Putinat school showing you that original grammar school. Water to live by. <laughs> Uh, remember, we don't get a lot of rain in Brownsville. So where do you get the water? Well, out of the river back then. Still do. And the, the way people obtained the water was through the piperos. And you can see the water carts here. You can see the big barrels on those carts. They, they would fill up the uh, barrels at the river and then drive them through town and people would come out with whatever they wanted to put their water in and they would, get, they would pay to get the water. Uh, so, and, and of course, what were they buying? Well, who knew since this was untreated river water? So you're taking whatever there happened to be. Now, if you had a nice house with a nice roof on it, and you could put up a kind of a gutter up there, you could run the water from the roof down here and over into your cistern. So you're getting rainwater down there. And notice the difference between a well and a cistern. And uh, so you would have nice rainwater, that was certainly a plus, and you would have it for yourself, you didn't have to go out and buy it, but what happened during periods when you didn't get any rain? See, doesn't, uh, this did not work out well all the time. Uh, Brownsville and Matamoros had a fairly close relationship in the late 19th century. Uh, a lot of commerce back and forth, uh, people owned businesses on both sides of the river, and so there was a lot of going back and forth, and you can see on a postcard there, uh, 
some rowboats. Those are ferry boats. Uh, flat bottom boats were used for crossing wagons with heavy loads using a cable system. But by the early 20th century, uh, you began to get bridges across the river. And here we list the bridges, the Brownsville and Matamoros, known as the B&M Bridge, which was a railroad bridge. That's the reason why it was established for the railroad. Then Gateway Bridge came in 1928, was replaced uh, in the 1950s. And then Veterans, or Saragossa, or Los Tomates, take your pick of the name you like, in 1999. And then the West Rail Bridge, which really isn't very close down here in 2015. Uh, for a long time, even a long time after I got here, uh, you had your choice of uh, which bridge you wanted to drive over, and you could drive over the, the gateway or you could drive over the old railroad bridge into Matamoros, uh, which could be a rather tricky operation, those of you who may remember, uh, if there were two cars passing, you could reach out and shake hands with the <laughs> car coming the other way. And then there is also the possibility you might get stuck with a train going through at some point, and then you're stuck trying to get back or trying to cross the other way. Always an adventure. Improvements in the 20th century. Uh, there was an effort in the 1890s to try to get some kind of water and sewage system, but when they totaled up the money they had, they found out they were short of the money they'd need to actually pull it off. So they really didn't get a sewage system and a water system until 1908, when the first one was established. Uh, and uh, in 1960, a uh, charter amendment approved creating the PUB. There was quite a controversy back at that time whether it would be better to have a private company run the local water and power system or the, uh, have a public run one. And they took out a vote in the city and this is what the result is. Irrigation. Irrigation would do what rainfall wouldn't do, and that is provide the water that would enable the raising of crops. Two things, two developments occurred right at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, massive irrigation and the coming of the railroad, because irrigation enabled the growing of large scale growing of crops and the railroad enabled the shipping of those crops to uh, other locations for sale, so to make it profitable. Uh, here's the names of two men who were involved in the very early years, in, in the 1880s. They started irrigation projects, but those were projects that depended on animal power and maybe some manpower to lift, literally lift the water out of the Rio Grande and pour it into ditches which would carry it to where the crops were. What you needed was steam power, and that's what they got, steam-powered pumps. And Frank Robb, who's shown there, uh, who had, was a pioneer in, in sugar plantations, along with George Brule, he diversified into vegetables and fruits and other, prod other uh, agricultural goods. There you see him, and there you see the Rob Plantation, uh, which is where they have the, uh, the Sable Palms uh, Park. Here you see some of the, the uh, pipes that would bring the water up from the pumps. Uh, and this, when this happened, there was a tremendous boom in land sales because now you could 
be productive in terms of agriculture and, and orchards and so on. And a lot of people came from the Midwest, United States, came down here and bought land. There was a brief boom in uh, almost right away, but that one was cut short by the Mexican Revolution, which kind of stymied things for, and then World War I and so on. But back in the 1920s, that's when you got the real big takeoff, the real big boom of people coming down to buy land and irrigate. And here you see uh, the Brownsville, an early Brownsville uh, pumping station. Uh, and you, the water would be, go into canals and then from the canals it would go into irrigation ditches. And here's the modern example of the pipes pulling the water out of the river or out of uh, whatever, <laughs> they, wherever they were pumping it from. On the other hand, flooding could, water could be a big problem when it comes to floods. And you did have a danger of uncontrolled flooding on the river uh, well into the 20th century because there wasn't anything to stop the water if it, got a lot of it, a big rainfall or storm or something, you, all that water could rush down here. On the side there, you see a, a soldiers building up levees on the Rio Grande during the, in 1916. I would bet that those soldiers were National Guard because at that time, uh, the National Guard was mobilized in 1916 and they sent down about 50,000 National Guard soldiers here to the border, uh, most of them uh, in the Rio Grande Valley because of concern that Pancho Villa might attack. <laughs> we had sent uh, General Pershing's forces into Mexico chasing Pancho Villa over in New Mexico into uh, Chihuahua. But the fear was that the Mexicans, in some form, might retaliate by attacking perhaps down in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and there were a few attempts. It uh, didn't amount to a whole lot, and some American forces briefly crossed into Mexico, chasing raiders that crossed over. But we had a whole bunch of people down here, and I, I would bet that those were some of them trying to give them something to do to keep them busy. River flooding. <laughs> 20th century, they began to establish dams along tributaries of the Rio Grande. But that didn't, really didn't limit what was coming from the river itself. Occasionally, you would have uh, uh, flooding. It would uh, get into the communities that, that bordered the river. Uh, in the delta, you know, when you get down here, and I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know already, when the river comes down, like my arm <laughs> coming down, then when it gets close to the, to the gulf, then it, like the fingers on your hand, it begins to uh, stretch out into other channels, different channels. And those channels can change. In other words, sometimes you'll have a horseshoe bend where the, the river is coming down and it goes, kind of sweeps up and then back down. Well, sometimes it eats away at the lower part all the way and makes a connection on the other side and what's left over of the horseshoe becomes a risaka. That's how they are created. Uh, in 1938, flooding moved the border south and created some of the UTRGV campus uh, because that's what happened. One of these channels, which was the, the main channel of the river, got cut off and the, another channel became the main channel for the river. I don't know if I'm getting, making this perfectly clear, but the result was that this body of water here, which is right on the UTRGV campus, that used to be the, the main channel of the Rio Grande. In other words, where these uh, students are walking, that would have been Mexico. So 
And that's as late as 1938. So water can have quite an influence, <laughs> even on borders. Hurricanes, wind and water, <laughs> not just water. Uh, I'm pointing out some of the major ones there. Uh, 1867, uh, very damaging. Uh, there are pictures of it, of what it damage it did in Matamoros as well as in Brownsville. They did some photographs immediately afterwards. Uh, 1933 was a devastating hurricane. They, they weren't, of course, back at those times, you didn't know it was coming. It was, the hurricane was often a big surprise. And the first courthouse in Brownsville had become the Masonic Lodge and it destroyed the roof and cupola on that uh, building, that 1933 hurricane. And of course, uh, much more recent, 1967, that was Hurricane Beulah. And here you can see the track of Beulah. And notice that the track turns purple right here. Well, what is purple? Category five. <laughs> 156 mile an hour winds. And you can see its track through there over the uh, Yucatan Peninsula and the destruction at Fort Brown and many other, and a lot of other photographs of the effects of the destruction created by Beulah. So, water control. In order to control the water on a river that's shared by two countries, you have to cooperate. And first, in 1889, the International Boundary and Water Commission was established by the two countries. And then, in 1944, and that's, you see the picture of them signing or making the agreement, treaty to allocate and manage river water. However, there are controversies till this day concerning water from the Mexican tributaries that they're supposed to share uh, with the U.S. and sometimes uh, the local people don't want to turn loose of that water. Here's the first of the tributary dams, the Marte R. Gomez Presa on uh, Rio San Juan in Tamaulipas was the first dam back in 1936 on a tributary. Uh, and, uh, this dam began limiting flooding on the Rio Grande. It couldn't eliminate it, but it, it was a way of limiting some of the water that might get fed in during a crisis period when you have too much water. And the Marte Ari Gomez was the first dam to do so. Pretty impressive dam, actually. They have a, I think it's a, a, a Lago Azúcar, something like that, Azucena. Uh, this was the first one. And here you see uh, water control issues on the river. Uh, you can see the river starting, starts way up in Colorado uh, through Albuquerque. There you've got reservoir at Elephant Butte. You can see some of the other places. There's the Amistad Reservoir, the Falcon Reservoir. That's because there are dams there in those places. Here's a Falcon Dam and the International Bridge and Port of Entry. Uh, it's in Star County. Farther up the river is Amistad at Del Rio. And then in Hidalgo County, Anzaldúas Dam, and they all provide water storage and control and recreational opportunities. And two of the three provide electrical power. So they perform several functions. Ah, yes. <laughs> As more and more communities began to take water out for uh, uh, municipal purposes, for water for the communities, and the communities got bigger, then you have problems of water flow. Will enough, will enough get down here is our concern, of course. Uh, droughts in the 1950s led to local demands for equitable water sharing and the appointment of a water master. Before I forget, Carlos Rubenstein, who I think is doing not the next 
talk, but the one after it, he was water master here for a while. Uh, and also, the Risakas became more important for water storage so that we would have access to water when needed and a place to put it when we had too much of it. Uh, in 1956, there was a suit in court, court lawsuit, uh, by the state of Texas, and it involved water from Falcon Dam to the Gulf. 3,500 claims on that water. Uh, most of them were brushed away. But two classes of water rights were established with priority for municipalities. So the municipalities would be guaranteed a certain portion of the water. Uh, however, uh, we outgrew our allotment. And so Brownsville had to go out and buy water from others. And that brings to mind, I don't know if you've ever been down to the Riverside PUB operation. Uh, I was down there on a PUB uh, guided tour. They took us down to where they take the water out of the Rio Grande. And I was kind of stunned, frankly, because it looked like a, a pretty small amount of water flowing over some rocks. You know, I thought we'd see a big stream or something like that. No. So uh, uh, we have uh, rather limited opportunities for water, so much so that PUB has even gone out and purchased land to the north of the city where they have groundwater access. Campaign for a seaport. Commodore, that by title, <laughs> Uh, Louis Cobellini led the efforts in the early 20th century because he foresaw ocean shipping as vital to Brownsville's future. And he was right. Uh, unfortunately, he died in uh, 1928, which was about eight years before they started, the, created the, uh, the waterway. And here you see the port area and uh, the ship channel and uh, not only do we have the ship channel and it's been widened some and uh, uh, here in the port they've made some expansions but also some of the companies there that have businesses along the ship channel are doing some new things for example uh, Keppel Amfels is doing more ship construction now. You know, they're noted for the oil platforms that they take out into the Gulf. But as some of that uh, business has diminished, they've begun to focus more on shipbuilding. And of course, there has been a lot of uh, ship deconstruction here. They bring down, brought down a number of um, Navy vessels and others and Brownsville became known, at least for a time, as the place where ships went to die. Yeah. The Brownsville Shrimp Fleet. And here you see the, the shrimp basin. And uh, it's located along the ship channel. And uh, I thought I'd give them a little publicity there. Uh, friends don't let friends eat imported shrimp. Uh, the uh, shrimp fleet is one of the biggest I could not find. Uh, it used, there was a claim at one time that it was the biggest. And maybe it is, or maybe it was, but I couldn't find any definitive proof of that. So anyway, uh, it's on the way, uh, road on the way out to uh, Padre Island. And of course, it's on the ship channel as, as well. Risakas. Here you see a nice Risaka view on the left. Uh, former channels of the Rio Grande that, as I've explained, have been cut off and they're, they're a breakthrough of a horseshoe bend. And you see uh, the, the uh, Risaka system over there. I don't think you can see it all very clearly, but there are like three, uh, three different sets, uh, three different uh, Risakas. Uh, the, the town Rosaka, there's uh, uh, 
Rio Viejo, there's uh, Rancho Viejo, Resaca. Anyway, they're kept filled by the city partly because they're water storage and partly because people like them. Historical appeal. There wasn't much till the 1920s. People really didn't give a thought to Resacas. You know, they were just water out there somewhere because people lived downtown. But starting in the 1920s, you had developments. Los Ebanos and Rio Viejo developments utilized the appeal of the Resacas. You could have a nice house on a Resaca. You know, it would be a house on water. And indeed, in many parts of the United States, there are people that dream of having something like that. Here in Brownsville, uh, you can have it. You know, you don't have to even be rich to have a home on Rasaka. I'm living proof of that. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's so appealing that developers continue to build on Rasaka lots and even created them. Here's Bill Hudson created his housing development using artificial Rasakas. He wouldn't have paid to have artificial Rasakas created if it weren't something that he thought would help sell the lots in his development. This is a LIDAR uh, scan. It scans for altitude, basically the, uh, whatever kind of waves they send out bounce back and show the elevations. And here it shows you some of the Risacas and uh, river. And over here, I just put that in. It's a development. I'm sure that uh, Jude Benavides in the next talk will talk about that. Uh, but uh, they're trying to restore the Risacas because over time they silt up. And uh, it's going to take a long time. But they started by the one over by uh, uh, town Resaca by the zoo and the cemetery. And that's where they've been doing some of that work. And here, look, you can see some of the restoration work going on. Rolando Inojosa Smith, professor at, uh, U at um, U University of Texas from the Valley. I think the family was from Brownsville. I know his sister. Uh, Clarissa Garcia uh, was here. I knew her quite well. And in it he writes, in writing this little tale, uh, basically it's a, a story of a migrant worker uh, who writes, a, or who says the following, it's the water, the Rio Grande water, the narrator says. It claims you, you understand? It's yours and you belong to it too. No matter where we work, we always come back to the border, to the valley. Thank you. <laughs>